Um, my name is Laura Boley and I'm from Neole. I'm the facilitator here today. And on behalf of Polar Knowledge Canada and Neole, I'd like to welcome you all to the Arctic char and other fish populations webinar. We're pleased to make this webinar available in three languages, Inuktitut, French and English. The slide that's now displayed shows you where the interpretation button is on your Zoom toolbar and how to select the language that you wish to listen to. Uh, just a note that when Inuktitut is spoken, you can switch to English or to French to hear the interpretation. The interpretation instructions are also placed in chat. This webinar is one of a series of webinars that Polar is launching this month, the Knowledge Sharing Webinar Series. I invite you to visit Polar's website for more information on the other webinars scheduled in the month of March. We've got uh, one more this week on climate change that's taking place tomorrow and two next week. And also visit the, the same website for information on future, web, on future webinars. Um, the link to Polar's website is in chat for you. Um, today's webinar highlights key points of a report on Arctic char and other fish populations that will be published later in the spring as part of Polar's Akaliat. Uh, when it's available, it'll be on the Polar website, so be sure to check the website. And I also suggest that you um, visit Polar Knowledge's uh, Facebook page and follow it so that you can stay up to date on when all the reports are published and uh, on future webinars. Now, I'd like to thank all those of you who have joined us today for this session. I'd also like to take the time to acknowledge that there are people in this session who are joining us from across the North and Canada. We acknowledge the valuable contributions Indigenous peoples have made and continue to make, both with respect to sharing your lands, your resources, your skills, and your knowledge. We further acknowledge a past that has done great harm and that much needs to be done to bring about true reconciliation. We appreciate that we have an obligation to learn, to listen, to be inclusive and respectful in all of our engagements. Today, we are very grateful for being able to have this knowledge sharing and exchange to help make our work be more inclusive and better as a result of incorporating Indigenous knowledge. I now invite Elder Timothy to open our meeting with opening remarks and a prayer. Thank you so much. Timothy, would you be able to give us some, thank you, some opening remarks? <laughs> Dear Lord, I pray to you today, as before we meet this afternoon, this morning in some places, as you know, as an Inuit people, we have many challenges in our regions, and sometimes our wildlife some scientists say that they are being depleted, but through your, through your guidance and wisdom, through our prayer, we ask you that you will help all of us to guide us in the right way that we need to make decisions on. In Lord's name, I pray to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very amen. much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce Jason Tologanak, Director of Knowledge Management and Engagement at Polar Knowledge Canada, who will also greet us with some opening remarks. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody, and, and, and thank you for joining uh, Polar Knowledge's webinars. Uh, it's really great to have everybody from across the north uh, join us in these uh, interactive uh, learning sessions. Uh, Polar Knowledge Canada is a science-based organization uh, mandated to advance knowledge of the Canadian North through science, technology, local, traditional, and Indigenous knowledge. As a small organization with a pan-Northern mandate, Polar strives to deliver results through collaborative projects and knowledge mobilization. 
creating and sharing knowledge to support evidence-based decision-making in the North. The discussions in the first five knowledge sharing webinars will be framed by questions co-developed at the regional planning and knowledge sharing workshop held here at the Canadian High Arctic Research Station in March of 2020. Indigenous knowledge holders, producers, and users came together at the workshop to discuss themes and issues important to Northern communities. Out of these discussions came the five themes of the collaborative assessment reports, which will be published on Polar's website as part of a Chiliat later this spring. The issues we are discussing today are very complex and addressing them can be challenging. The Canadian North spans thousands of kilometers and different regions experience and understand issues in different ways. Years of lived experiences on the land provide a wealth of knowledge uniting ways of knowing scientific, technological, local, traditional, and indigenous knowledge provides new insights to support innovative solutions to the challenges faced by Northerners. The inclusion of local, traditional, and indigenous knowledge and prioritizing community voices in these webinars and other knowledge mobilization strategies is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason, for giving us some background on the, um, the Arctic Char report and on today's webinar and for starting off our discussion. Um, as Jason explained, the thematic questions that the Arctic Char report was based on were the outcome of the March 2020 Regional Planning and Knowledge Sharing Workshop held at the Canadian High Arctic Research Station in Nunavut. During this webinar, and as the Arctic Char Report nears publication, it's only fitting that we revisit these original thematic questions with today's participants, the Indigenous knowledge holders, community members, and authors who contributed to the report and who are interested in bridging gaps in knowledge and emerging opportunities that are presented in the report. We all know that questions make more questions. And as you listen to today's discussion, we invite you to type your questions in the, in the Q&A function in Zoom. And you can find that on the uh, Zoom toolbar. It says Q&A and there's two little speech bubbles. And just click on that. And um, oh, there's a slide, thanks so much. So there's the little icon. And if you click on that, there's a space for you to type in your questions and that helps us actually to keep track of which questions have been answered. But if you uh, type your questions into chat, that's okay too. Um, the chat is available for you to communicate with all the panelists that you see up here on the screen today. And we're watching the chat for questions. We'll try to make sure that all the questions are answered. If not today, then at a later date. Before we start, I'd like to invite those of you in the audience and on our panel today to do two things. First, I invite you to be comfortable with silence. This is, this is a discussion more than a formal presentation or a webinar and gaps in conversation will happen. We're also dealing with um, technology and great distances. So silence is also inevitable because of that. More importantly, though, this, the silence helps us to make space for people to compose their thoughts and contribute. Secondly, I invite you all to be curious. Please make good use of that Q&A button and the uh, chat button. Um, Marlene, um, great question about putting up your hand. Panelists, yes. Attendees out in the audience, I can't see you. <laughs> but people who are up on the screen today, um, there's a little raise hand function in Zoom. It's down on the Zoom toolbar and you can click on that. Also, those of you who have your cameras on, if you simply just raise your hand, I'll see you as well. <laughs> okay, let's get to know our panelists today. So I'd like to invite all of our panelists to turn their cameras on and tell us your name and where you are joining us from. Johnny, 
as per usual, you are up in my top left-hand corner of my screen. So I'm going to start with you if you don't mind. I don't know why that is, but anyways, um, I'm Johnny Lenny and I'm from Inuvik, Northwest Territories, and I'm an Inuvalok har harvester. Good night, Nick. Thank you, Johnny. Lauren. Hi, um, I'm Lauren Tingayak from uh, Nauya. It was uh, formerly called Repo Bay. Thank you. Thank you. Ningola, who do you have with you today? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, my name is Ningola Khaliktik from Kimmeru Unabut, and I have. I also take part in meetings. from Kimmerut. Thank you. Um, Stephen. Yeah. Hi, Stephen. Hi, uh, Stephen Lonsdale. Good afternoon. I'm Stephen Lonsdale. I'm with the Nunavut Wildlife Management Board. You might have heard already about the uh, shorten for NWMB. Uh, you already know what they are. I seem I also am a panelist. I don't know if it's an error, <laughs> but it's that's I'm a panelist. I thought I was just a um, participant. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Surprise. <laughs> um, uh, Eva and Timothy, please, next. My name is Eva from Kamanituak, Baker Lake. I'm a member of the HTO here. I, I know you could recognize me, some of you. I'm a member of the HTO here in Baker Lake. I'm also a harvester hunter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Norman. <laughs> Hi, thanks for joining us today. Oh, um, Norman Mike Pannaktu. Um, my name's Norman Mike from Pannaktu. Um, I'm a fisherman. I'll be alone. I was going to be with someone, but the, that person's unavailable. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Marlene. Hi, Marlene Evans, uh, Environment Canada, Saskatoon. I'm a researcher. Thanks, Marlene. And Les Harris. Uh, good luck, everyone. Good morning, or I guess good afternoon, depending on where in the country you're calling from. My name is Les Harris. I'm a researcher with Fisheries and Oceans Canada based out of Winnipeg. I've been uh, studying fish in the Arctic now for 20 years or so, starting in Inuvik and uh, now mostly in the Katikmiut and the uh, Kivalik regions of Nunavut. I just want to say uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I'm honored and really excited to uh, partake in this today. Thank you, Les. And Marianne. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marianne. I'm a researcher at Université Laval. Uh, very pleased to be here today. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So to start off, um, I was re reviewing the draft of the report this morning. And I thought um, I, would, I would spring a question on you that we hadn't talked about before. Um, this is for the report authors. Um, for our audience who might not be familiar with the Arctic char, can you tell us the difference between the landlocked Arctic char and the sea run Arctic char? Please. Yeah, Les. Uh, thank you, Laura. 
Uh, yeah, no problem. It's it's kind of cool that uh, Arctic char actually have uh, three different life history types or way that they live their life. You mentioned uh, two of them there. And so the landlocked char, char that kind of mature at smaller ages, faster or slower uh, growing, sorry, slower growth patterns, uh, but they don't have access to the ocean. So they're kind of trapped in these inland lakes, whereas the sea run Arctic char live in these lakes that do have access to the ocean. And so they often take these migrations to feed in the ocean and then return to freshwater to spawn and or overwinter uh, every year. And there is a third kind of cool species or uh, life history that does have access to the ocean, but decides to spend its entire life in freshwater. And uh, we refer to those as freshwater residents. Oh, okay, okay. And which char are we going to focus on today, mostly? Uh, mostly the sea run char. It seems to be a, a very important uh, life history form from the subsistence standpoint, but also recreationally. And, and there are uh, commercial fisheries that exist and are developing throughout Nunavut right now as, as we're speaking. So it's a pretty important species. But I do believe we, we touch on the landlocked form a little bit in the, in the report. Okay, thank you. So um, I was wondering, um, I'd like to ask our, our participants, our panelists from, from the North, uh, anybody who would like to uh, speak, why are Arctic char important to you? Why are they important to Northern communities and to you? Lauren? Yes, thank you. Um, and the Arctic char um, is in, important to us in, in this town, in Naoyan, is because it's a very, very good food, um, besides uh, caribou. And sometimes we, have, we catch them and we sell them to the other communities in town. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Norman, did you, do you, can you tell us why Arctic char are important to uh, the North? <clears throat> um, it's part of our, the fish is part of our life, I believe. Um, it's our main food source where I live and it's a, it in it's a large commercial fishery here too in Pang. Although we only catch about twenty five thousand pounds commercially and never ending fishing for community. Um, as of one week my brother and I um, actually fish for a whole community pretty much since the winter came and uh, it yeah it's very important for us it's part of our e economy now too in this community mm -hmm. for at least about 30 years and it actually started way before I started, and it's very important now for this community, commercially and for for uh, individual use. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And um, the ladies joining with Niula. Your, your mom, and um, I wonder if we could get a lady's perspective on the importance of the Arctic char to your community. Yes, it's a very vital part of our culture. It's important. It's a very important part of us. We can make different types of dishes 
It's an important food source. We can eat it raw. Uh, it's a food source. If anyone who's an Inuk cannot eat it, and, and that, that would be a different person, but it's a big part of our culture. It's about who we are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and one more question for uh, our panelists from the North. Um, are you seeing any changes in, um, in the Arctic char in terms of their color, their size, or maybe anything that you're noticing that's different? Wow. Okay. Yes, Norman? Sorry, Mamiana. Yeah, we we know. I had it on mute. My apologies. Um, the food chain is different now. The we we never used to have cape plants and some uh, herrings that we see nowadays in our coast and. When I started fishing commercially, I, I acknowledged myself not knowing I was also teaching myself in terms of the colors mm -hmm. or whatnot. And yeah, the, 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 up here, the food color changed, but, but the taste never really changed. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. And that's how, and we didn't stop eating the fish, even though the, some of the, some of the fish color changed to a lighter color, although it's still orange. Um, I actually have pictures, but it's in my other computer. I didn't have connection good connection I had to move to a area okay. where I live but anyways yeah we've seen changes in the last 15 odd years or 20 since I don't know about the rest of Nunavut but where we live we've seen some changes mm -hmm. thank you thank you um so from our uh, report authors um I was wondering um how might the Arctic char be impacted by the changing climate, by changing northern conditions? Les, uh, Marianne, yep, Les. I guess I could go first. Sure. Um, I mean, that's a that's a pretty pretty big question. Mm. And, uh, I think that they'll be impacted by a lot of different things, and, and there could be even cumulative impacts, but. Ones that come to mind quickly are, are increases in temperatures in the ocean and, and freshwater habitats that they rely on. Uh, there could be increases in erosion, which it could impact the rivers that they have to migrate through. Um, increases in potential southern species that are now able to expand northward as sort of the water temperatures that they need to live get a little bit warmer in northern climates. Um, so I, I think that uh, there are a lot of different impacts, but I, I think temperature is probably one that is going to have sort of like the most uh, uh, profound impact on char, in my opinion. Thank you. Thanks. Um, there's actually a couple of uh, questions from the audience that have to do with the color change of the Arctic char. Um, are there some scientific reasons between the color change or have you observed a color change in them? And why, if there is, why might that be? Uh, Marlene or Marianne, if you, oh, there's Marianne, hi. Marianne, I can say a few words that um, some pigments in the flesh of char are related to the color, especially carotenoids. Um, and astaxanthin, I know it's a 
rough word, but it's uh, the name of a molecule that gives uh, fish like salmon and char their reddish color. And these can only be found in their food. So in uh, plankton and, and some of the sh tiny shrimps that we find in the ocean. Um, so we definitely need to do more research about that. But we suspect that some changes in the in what char eats in the ocean from, for example, tiny shrimps that have a lot of these molecules that give a reddish color to, mm -hmm. for example, capelin and herring that you were talking about, Norman, uh, could potentially have this change in, in color through different molecules that are found in the, in the prey. So I hope that was clear, but that's my, my two cents on the question. Thanks. Marlene, did you want to jump in? I'll just re reiterate what uh, Marion said that um, uh, the changes in color relate to changes in their diet and the pigments of the food in their diet. For mm -hmm. uh, some lake trout on, uh, in Northwest Territories, the, the, the uh, fishermen there noticed that when the lake trout were eating a lot of uh, the bottom animals, they had very pink flesh. But if they were eating mainly you know, fish, they, their flesh was white. And of course, you can tell by just opening up the fish's stomach to see what's in it. But, it, but as Marion said, it's related to the type of food that it's eating. Yes, Les. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'll just uh, just quickly add to that that uh, there are, there are a couple of places where this has sort of been more noticeable than than others. And as Norma was talking, Cumberland Sound is a, a classic example where. Capelin has come in and, and kind of really changed things in that area, including the, the flesh color of char. And in Cambridge Bay, we've done some work with the uh, sort of northward colonization of sandlands. Uh, so there are a few places throughout Nunavut where we're really seeing this and, and we're putting in some pretty good efforts to try to understand the impact of these species that are, are moving north. But I just wanted to sort of highlight that um, no matter what color that uh, char flesh is, whether it's that beautiful dark red that everyone is after down to the lighter oranges or even more whiter um, they still remain a super super healthy uh, awesome country food just packed full of nutrients and, and omega-3s so thank you les um i'm going to call on timothy because les what you just said was a terrific lead-in. Timothy, don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> Timothy, in um, the environmental change webinar last week, wondered about the level of mercury in the fish. I, I'm guessing specifically the Arctic char. Maybe we could talk about them first. So Timothy, do you want to say a little bit more about your worry about mercury in fish that, that you're eating? Yeah, I tried to want to comment on that about that trout and in our Arctic regions, for particularly those that are in the lakes, the fish species. We've, we've been noticing that uh, as you were as we were talking about the changes in the color and we're finding that to be the case here in, in, in our area in the summertime and when you notice the lakes are gushing out into the ocean at a faster pace that time of the year and you know then the fish are available also because they're going out to sea. And, and then we also harvest them at that time of the year. I'm wondering though, is, is, is it perhaps that the temperature of the ocean around that time of the year, could that be another cause as to the changes in the color of the fish? And that's why the, the color, the reddish color seems to dissipate more quickly around that time of the year. I'm just wondering about that. Also, the landlocked fish. Whenever we um, find that locally they're being sold, I know that 
it's an issue on the prices that are available. I'm looking at around $65, $50. Um, the prices be due to inflation have gone up and it's affecting the community's uh, ability to be able to have uh, local fish. Hmm. And this is a concern that was raised. So people are not able to eat fish. That's another concern I'd raise. Uh, I'll end there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, the the color of the fish, I it's it seems to me it's quite complex um, in reviewing the report. It's very much tied into what they're eating and possibly they're eating different things because of the changing temperature of the oceans. Um, can you and 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 Les, you said that I think it was you Les that the the darker colored meat is more valuable, which maybe is reflected in the price of the fish. I don't know. Can you kind of pull this apart for us a little bit, Marlene or Les or Marianne? Um, sure, I can I can start. Uh, so the the initial question was, can temperature itself directly impact the sort of the color of the fish. And that's a that's an excellent question. And uh, honestly, one that I do not have the answer to. I wish one of our other co-authors, Matt Gilbert was here because he is a temperature guru and uh, would probably know if there was literature to, to support that. But you're right, um, indirectly, then you could consider temperature impacting the, the quality or the color of the fish because those increases in temperature are allowing sort of those newer species to come in that they might be opportunistically feeding on a lot more, which could impact sort of the, the, uh, the color of their skin in the end. So not temperature directly, but sort of, uh, sort of indirectly. And uh, yeah, from a, from a marketing perspective, certainly when it comes to stuff like the, uh, like the picturesque frozen Arctic char fillet that you see, the, the orange, very bright orange or, or even red coloration seems to be a little bit more appealing. And I know at some of the fish plants when uh, like out of Rankin Inlet or, or Cambridge Bay, I'm not sure about Pangardung, the, the more whiter colored or less desirable fish will get processed into things like uh, char candy or char jerky or smoked char, stuff like that. So I hope that sort of somewhat answers the question. Thank you. Interesting. Johnny, what are your thoughts on, on the conversation and uh, Arctic char, the, any changes that you might be seeing? Um, over in the West here, um, we do catch a couple types of char and uh, freshwater back and forth to the ocean and uh, also sea run char in the North Yukon. But um, no, as uh, there definitely been uh, a decline, like uh, in the char itself, and but they we impose lots of restrictions on it, and hopefully they're recovering. That's in the Fish River. Les uh, should know something about it. He was here in Inuvik. They've done a lot of studies on them, and mainly just uh, population studies, and and. Uh, Definitely, like there's, they they dropped really, like thirty years ago. They just like the fresh Dolly Varden char, they call it. They really dropped in our area, and it's not they're not commercially harvested. They're just used for local use, and extended family and whoever likes it. It's very delicious and a favorable fish. And also the sea run char, a lot of people go to the coast, uh, the North Yukon, and they catch a lot of char up there too. And as far as colors, yeah, we always seen different colors and and definitely the deep red is a delicacy and and it's a very important food staple. Like it's a like for us, you know, when we when we used to do a lot of fishing, we used to do lots of fishing with uh, when we had dogs when we were younger. And you know, there's good fish in dog feed, and char was good fish, and 
and that conies and whitefish, uh, they're all good fish. But well, I don't know if you can eat char, you can eat it, you know, frozen, cooked or, or raw, thought out, and you don't get you don't get sick or parasites. Maybe that's why it's tied into the good fish, meaning that we somebody decided a long time ago, like they, we because uh, more studies, maybe less can verify that, that a lot of these other fish like jacks and uh, crooked, white, crooked back white fish and suckers, they all have, they all have parasites and like that, that'll be very uh, detrimental to, you know, mm -hmm. for us to eat them, especially if they're frozen or raw. But mm -hmm. anyways, I, I just wanted to add that, but yeah, there's, but the populations have been coming back in the Dolly Varden char with restrictions, but, but they've been fishing, we've been fishing them since time in the mountains. Usually that's where they used to go fishing for them. Like they used to go back, you know, way up upstream in the rivers in the fall, but they just started to decline when they started fishing the mouth of the river. And that's what they stopped right away once they seen a population decrease. I just thought I'd throw that in. Come Thank on you. Up. Thank you. Um, I, I want to come back to the parasites and um, contaminants in general in the Arctic char. But um, I wanted to take a question from the audience first. This is from Alex, uh, who says, the sea ice cover is declining. Under the ice is where you find the most amphipods. Is the declining sea ice not the link between temperature, diet, and char flesh color? Perhaps it's not only that new prey species are present, but there's less traditional prey species. So again, it's that interconnectedness between all these elements. So um, one of our authors care to comment? I'm going to put Marianne on the spot and, and defer <laughs> to her for this one. Sorry, Marianne, but... I think this fits nicely with, with some of the work that she's done, uh, including the, the follow-up question that I see here from Samantha on uh, changes in body size or, or uh, condition as well. Uh, Marianne has recently done some work uh, that has shown some pretty cool things as well. So, sorry, Marianne. Thanks, Les, no problem. Uh, yeah, these are really great questions and it, it really ties to these interconnectedness between different changes. Um, and so in some studies that we've done with Les and also um, in the Beaufort Sea, um, the, the sea ice um, breakup is a very good proxy or the date of ice clearance. So when the ice breaks up is a really good proxy uh, for different char indicators of their condition. Um, so I think that sort of highlights how the dates of the sea ice breakup has a huge influence on, on so many biological processes related to char, especially their diet, because I mean, they're, they migrate to the ocean to feed on all of these sprays. So um, if the sea ice um, breaks at a different time, it's going to influence the types of prey that they find when they get into the ocean. And then in turn, it could influence their color. Um, their condition as well, if the prey that are there have different lipid content uh, or are in different abundances. So um, these are definitely complex changes, but this sort of um, connection between sea ice and, and then the prey in the ocean and then the char is definitely a critical one to uh, study uh, to understand how these changes are going to unfold. So thank you for these questions and I'm seeing some uh, hands so perhaps some others can complement what I just have said. Mm -hmm. um, I see Stephen has his hand up. And yes, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm still not sure how I ended up as a, as a panelist. I actually thought I was um, signing up as a participant, but luckily I have been fishing pretty much all my life ever since I was a kid and I fish all year round around Iqaluit, so I, I have had a lot of exposure to this. So I'm more than happy to uh, contribute. <laughs> so there's, um, you know, there are concerns about uh, the temperature uh, of, of the oceans and the early ice breakup in uh, relation to the food. Uh, and that had me thinking about, um, according to, uh, 
when the mosquitoes uh, come out in the summer is about the same time as the fish start coming down. Mm -hmm. And the correlation there is, is water temperature. So as soon as it's warm enough for bugs to come out, there's something within fish that triggers that need, that uh, instinct to migrate. So there is definitely somewhere in there a connection between temperature and the migration itself. And then when I see like very old footage of um, Inuit hunting with kukivuks uh, on the sea ice, the sea ice is so thick and they're just all over the place going to different cracks and there's big groups of them. And then right now, anyway, in, in my lifetime, there's barely enough time to fish on the sea ice when the fish come down and it actually gets a little bit dangerous because it's almost it's free floating ice and that can kind of break away at any time so i try to go fishing every year on the sea ice just before the the breakup but mm -hmm. that time is that window is getting shorter and shorter so you know going back to the traditional knowledge of um, mosquitoes and the timing of migration, it is something with temperature. So that can be easily, I don't know, interpreted in, in different ways. So uh, thank you. Thanks. Marlene, I see your hand up. Yeah, this, this whole thing with uh, uh, warming temperatures in spring is really fascinating. Um, it is true that things like amphipods uh, live under the ice and they, they kind of scrape on the algae that are at the bottom of the ice and they feed on that. But um, the other thing that's important with spring is there's a bunch of things called zooplankton um, that live in the water column. And they're also uh, an important food item for small, small fish like capelin, I believe, and I forgot the other one. So what Lois Harwood and ourselves to a lesser extent have seen is that when you have earlier springs and uh, warmer temperatures, the fish actually seem to put on more weight and, and do a lot better than in uh, colder springs. And nobody knows why that might be occurring, but it might be possible that with the earlier springs, you have these uh, phytoplankton blooms faster and it supports more zooplankton, and then it supports more of the capelin, which allows the char that are out there to uh, have more fish to eat. So it's, it's, it's a very complicated question. That's why us researchers like research, because we keep coming up with questions that are interesting to investigate. But uh, yeah, there's a lot that could be going on. Um, thanks, Marlene. Johnny, did I see your hand up? And, and Norman, I, I see you. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on Stephen's um, uh, on the temperatures and uh, just add to it that for the freshwater char that comes up the river, I guess I know I call sea run char just uh, the ones that just live in the sea, but the, the ones that come up, up the rivers, like generally, like they come up when it starts to cool. And uh, traditional, you know, what I heard in the past was when the leaves start to turn color, that's when it's time to fish for the Dolly Varden. I just wanted to add that. Definitely, I'm sure the fall temperature maybe has something to do with it. Uh, Norman? Yeah. Um, yeah, I relate to most of the guys that are saying about char on uh, temperature from going to ocean. Uh, but in our area, of when we're commercially fishing, we wait till they uh, go down to ocean. That's when the high current and uh, our are like uh, when it's full moon, that's when the, they start to go down the ocean where I live, most of them anyways. And 
like uh, Stephen said, when mosquitoes start to form around here, the char will start to go around the ocean, pretty much all over Cumberland, I say. And there's and when they're when they're going back to lake and then it's same thing happens the full moon that's when the river starts to flow more and the current starts to go higher than normal when it's full moon although they're only in ocean roughly about two months from the lake that we know of, and uh, a lot of times their stomachs are full when they're going back, it, either cods or those little fish, I don't know the name, but they're tiny ones. And nowadays, capelins are in their stomach and some herrings and um, yeah, it's pretty much based on current I believe when they start to go up the lake after spending time in the ocean and in our traditional knowledge um, this really uh, thing uh, the thing I heard before that I can never forget that my grandfather said that they don't eat again the rest of the season when they're back to when they're back at the lake after harvesting their food in the ocean and then they don't eat again until they're back next year, a year later at least. That's how much their food chain change. And I don't think there's ever been shortage of food for them in our area because we never seen I at least fish in 18 different lakes in my lifetime in our area. And some of our, some of the lakes are closed due to uh, um, not population, but the size population start to decrease when we overfish them. And we, um, we study in our own knowledge, I believe. And when it, when when guys like less uh, DFO people comes around and then we start to talk and figure out and their research are pretty accurate. Like if we compare our inner knowledge and uh, scientific research knowledge, it's very comparable how they, compromise and the way we compromise in a new way and very similarities and the the knowledge with dfo and inuit are becoming more of a interesting more and more because it's opening more businesses and commercials um i believe and uh that's what I wanted to add it. And uh, I believe we are getting more fish and fish. We need to study more and get in, inside and biopsy and all that stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Oh, yes, Les. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Norman. Everyone, those are awesome questions and awesome points. And the, yeah, the, the way that the, the Kaya Mayahunga get lines up with the, the Western science is absolutely incredible sometimes. But uh, we kind of hit on, on so many points those last couple of questions. I, I just want to kind of go back to a couple of them because it's, it's super, super interesting. And, and you're right, the, uh, um, like starting with their, their downstream migration, the, there could be lots of triggers that, that uh, kind of sort of prod them or, or get them hyped up to, to get to the ocean. And at these latitudes, they, they wanna to go to the ocean because there's just so much more food there and so much more food jam-packed with the stuff that they need to survive that long period like you, 
like you mentioned, Norman, where they don't feed for eight, 10, sometimes in, in the Cambridge Bay area, it could be as high as 20 months without, uh, without having food. So they really need to get to the ocean to, to sort of uh, uh, stock up their, their fat reserves to make, through the, make it through the winter. And so it could be things like sunlight is triggering them, um, the like mosquito hatches, just changing in, in sort of the, the, that freshwater ecosystem as the sort of sun comes back to the Arctic is super cool. But also the, uh, the river's breaking. A, a lot of our recent telemetry evidence is, has shown that when it gets close to river breakup, they'll start migrating to those outflows. And that could be triggered by sunlight or mosquitoes or whatever. And as soon as those rivers break, they're they're in the ocean. They have to get there as soon as possible to, to eat all that food. And we think that they, uh, uh, another kind of interesting thing about Arctic char is they, they can't actually survive the winter in the ocean. The, the temperature of the ocean freezes at levels that Arctic char can't stand. So that's why they have to come back to freshwater every single year. And we do think it is some sort of, uh, uh, they have to get back before the water temperatures get cold, but there is some sort of threshold where they've uh, sort of gained enough fat reserves to last them through that, that long winter that'll kind of trigger them to go back upstream. So it's just, yeah, they're just fascinating. They do wild things. So uh, really good points. Thank you, Norm. Um, Marlene, I uh, did want to fit in your fascinating slide on pollutants and mercury and invite um, our northern participants to ask questions of you, should they have any, before we, then I want to circle back to what we were just discussing, because I heard lots of opportunities for further research, and um, that's where we'll wrap up today, but I wanted to get in that slide, so Lena, I wonder if you have that ready, there we go. Uh, so, so do you want me to talk around the slide? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so uh, people often worry or wonder about uh, mercury in, uh, in fish. And uh, uh, so um, there's a, a certain concentration of mercury in fish where um, um, there, there's what's called uh, consumption advice is issued sometime. And what we what we found out with uh, the sea run chart, this is actually a lake lake pitch. I should have brought up another one. I, was, I wasn't thinking clearly this morning, but but the uh, mercury concentrations in the uh, sea run chart are really, really, really low. Any fish that we've ever measured that's ever been caught in the uh, in the ocean, those are fish that less has provided us. Uh, fish we've gotten from all the communities across the Arctic. We, I think we looked at 20. The concentrations are always around that little green value there, around like the, the 0 0.1. So mercury in sea run char is, is simply not an issue. It's very hard to catch a fish that has such low mercury concentrations. Um, this is a... a uh, it's a bit different with fish that live in lakes year round. So we, we do see higher concentrations in, in uh, lake trout and uh, some white fish. So I don't know if people want me to, to go into this graph in detail, but, but basically as a fish gets bigger, it tends to have a bit more mercury in it just because it's been eating for a longer, longer period of time. So this is what this pictorial graph shows. And I think I'll just open it for questions right now, but if people have any, but I just want to reiterate that um, the fish caught in the ocean are very, very, very low in mercury, much lower than most lake fish. Um, who has a question for Marlene? Eva, do you, do you have a question for Marlene about the mercury or other um, concerns you might have about the quality of the fish? Thank you. Yes, my name is Eva. Uh, my question is,
during the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we noticed that the fish was more firm. But we're finding nowadays the fish is not firm and they tend to be very soft. So I, that's my question. Has anybody found out why that's happening? Thank you. Uh, well, I'll just say something quick. And then I think Les wants to talk if I don't see his hand up. Uh, firm fish tend to be associated with uh, fattier fish and colder, colder temperatures often. So, um, it might, might in part just be related to uh, temperature and, and fat content, but I think Les could talk maybe to that, or Marianne. Uh, thank you, Marlene. Uh, thanks for the question. I, I honestly do not have, have a good answer for that question, but um, one my mind always goes back to sort of these, these ecosystem level changes and, and changes in the the species that are in the area now. And, and if uh, char in the 70s and 80s were feeding on a, a completely different food source than what they have available to them now, um, then I think that that could possibly be part of the reason that, that you're seeing differences in that flesh quality. But, so I'm just sort of speculating right now, maybe Marianne can, can add to that. No, I think uh, what Marlene and Les you said is, are good uh, hypothesis for why is that. I also heard and wonder if temperature in the ocean could have this effect because I did hear people saying that char today are less uh, sort of, or more smooshy sort of, I'm not sure how the translation is gonna <laughs> translate smooshy, but I'm not sure of the word, but I think this is a very interesting observation and it would be interesting to do some studies perhaps like in the uh, tanks to, expose fish at to different uh, temperature conditions and, and feeding to see if it influences the flesh in this way. So I would be curious to know if there are some studies like this. Um, but yeah, we need to study more about that. I've seen studies. Hmm. Go, go ahead, Marlene. I've seen uh, <laughs> the results of studies for lake trout on the Great Lakes where their water content increases through the fall and winter as they stop feeding and they're using more of the, their fat reserves. So I think I think fish that have uh, the watery, they just they just don't have the same fat in them as um, fish that appear firmer. And then sometimes, uh, you know, when it was colder, people would would maybe. Uh, uh, get the fish out of the nets quicker and process them quicker. And now that it's uh, warmer, maybe people leave the you know the, fit, the fish in the nets a bit longer than they might have in the past, or take a bit more time before they process them. That that pop, that may also be a, a possibility. You know, depending on how the how, how long the nets are set and the fish are handled, but. I think it's probably related more to temperature, is my guess. Thanks, Norman. Hi, um, I'll, I'll reply in 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 inuktitut. When they're going to have uh, fish for commercial sales. One of the things we try to ensure is that we don't allow the fish to be tender or squishy, as was mentioned by Marianne. So we try not to have it a soft meat. There's some different types of fish that are available to sell for the commercial buyers. So the different grading system, we also have a time limit of three days. And if it reaches beyond three days, if it's, let's say reaches four days, we cannot sell that, sell that batch of fish because um, the fish will be too soft. And we, we know that the 
person who's in charge of um, assigning what could be sold, th that's the decision that's made. And of course, when the nets are out and what we try to do is catch, release it from the net as fast as possible because of the, that very fact that it can get soft. So when it's, uh, when it's raw, but according to Inuit, we tend to sl slice off the head so that it will reduce the, that happening from the texture to become uh, soft. I don't know what do you guys think about that, but as far as um, Inuit knowledge, we have steps to ensure that the meat stays um, in a certain way and that we, we try to ensure that when we have fish, that our fish is going to be quality for the users, those that are gonna eat the fish. I'm trying to respond to that person's question that perhaps the meat is had been out too long. Maybe that's what happened. But according to Inuit, we try to be cautious and aware of the time that it's out when it's caught to take action to deal with the food and to ensure that it, it remains fresh and to ensure that the practice of keeping it fresh and the steps are taken. So we know that if you keep the fish out, it'll become um, soft. I wanted to add, those are the things that we've noticed and I could share with you and because I just wanted to help that person. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, and thank you Eva, for your excellent question. Uh, Niola, you've got your hand up. Oh, you're muted. Oh, you're you're muted though. <laughs> Sorry. It was me that I had my hand up. Our fish um, in the different regions of our area are all different. According to our knowledge, we don't always have, um, we don't have a commercial fishery, but we do know aware of our, the locations of the fish, where there's plenty of fish, the types of fish, even a fish. When you keep it at a cold temperature, will not become soft. I just wanted to share that. In the South, you know, it's warm temperature. And anyone who lives in further southern regions, that's going to be an issue where your fish is going to become soft. So that's definitely a factor, the temperature. And you know that according to Inuit, once the fish are full and fat, that's when they want to get back up to the lakes. Also, somebody was mentioning about the, the color of the fish in the fall time when the temperatures are starting to cool down. The, the color of each male or female fish changes at that time of the year. And so it's also according to the location of the fish on the the geography of the land where they're located that can also be different in terms of how the changes occur so it depends on where they are located so sometimes though we've noticed that yes the the, the texture of the color is changing a little bit and i just wanted to share that quickly and i wanted to be brief i in the inuit land It's cold, so the fish will tend to stay uh, more firmer longer, but that's just my comment. 
Yeah, me too. Thank you. In Kimerut. I'm a member of the hunters and trappers. I occasionally go out and harvest myself. And in the proximity of Kimerut, all our locations, in particularly the left side, the closer ones, the locations where there's fish, there are fishing spots. Some of them are not too far. And there's a few that are closer to Kimirut, but I can tell you the further ones are um, often preferred to go get fish. Also, the further ones, about, I could tell you 100 miles, that's the distance that they like to go out and catch fish. Um, they like they like to catch it even just as recently as this past winter. We know that fish, the species of fish. We also know that the quantity of fish that is caught and when the quantity of fish is decreased, that can cause a change in the, um, the type of um, color or the way the fish behaves. And so that could there could be factors as to and when the numbers reduce or when they increase. And we know that fish can travel great distances. We know this through oral knowledge that fish, the closer fishing spot that we have, the fish that would normally return. And also some of them have been replaced, I feel, by other fish stocks. And so there's an intermixing of stock. I found that the meat was more whitish. And nowadays, when we look at the outer color of the fish, we know that the texture is also changing and there's the color is more orangey color. So this is some of the stock of the fish. And also the further distance we go, the other fishing spot. It's also, um, the, the stock seems to be a stranger group. So we're finding that perhaps uh, they're bonier fish that are coming in this past winter. The harvesters that went out to catch fish, it could be anybody, anybody from Kimmero. They've been observing that there have been real changes into the, the texture and the type and uh, the way they look. There was also a fish caught that was strange. And we know because fish can travel great distances. And sometimes, sometimes um, some of the stock, even though they migrate back up to the lake, some of them could be remaining behind for a number of years, but also return to the lakes at a later time in their lifetime. And also, for some of us that have been accustomed to hearing stories from the olden days, we've heard some of the stories where the fish would be more red and that was a preferred one that somebody was talking about, but we've known this, but I know that it doesn't matter where they're from, they can travel great distances. And so I just wanted to share that. Uh, I'm going to go too long, so I'll just end there for now. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, Marlene, um, there are so many opportunities for further research. What do you think are the priorities? I'm sorry, are you asking me? Yeah, yeah, your hand's up. So oh, no, I, I was going to talk but about, <laughs> I was going to say wanted... one, one last thing about flesh texture, and that that's parasites. Mm -hmm. If a fish has a lot of parasites in it, that can change its fish texture. There's some fish char at Netling Lake, their livers, they've got so many parasites in them, their livers practically fall apart. So the parasites can be under the gills, along the body wall, and in the guts. And Fisheries and Oceans has a very good pamphlet on parasites and fish. It shows that shows you the pictures of where the parasites occur, what they look like, whether you could eat the fish or not. But I just think that's something important to consider. And also to be aware that Fisheries and Oceans has a very, very good pamphlet that you can download off the web on identifying parasites. Okay. okay. The fish say, safe to eat though, the char, the sea run char? Some parasites, no, you can't eat them. You have to cook the meat or sh less, I'll let Les talk, he's the, but yeah, no, you gotta watch about e eating fish with parasites in them. Sure. Thanks, Marlene. Uh, I wish I was a parasitologist. I just have some parasite data that I get to play with once in a while. Uh, Colin Gallagher, who was actually one of the co-authors on the paper would be, be the guest, best guy to talk to. But uh, from my understanding, there's only one sort of species of parasite. It's a tapeworm species that can be transmitted to humans. And as Marlene said, as, as long as you cook the fish, then you're, you're totally fine. Okay. So Les, while we have you here, we've heard, we've heard a lot today. And thinking about what you've heard today from um, our Indigenous knowledge holders and um, some of the changes that are taking place and the, the concerns that people have, what kind of research could be done with communities to improve monitoring and assessment of Arctic char? Yeah, very, very good question. I, I really don't want this, uh, this webinar to end because I've been jotting yeah. down notes of questions I want to ask and, and points I want to raise, but, but that, is a, that is a good one and it's a pretty tough question as well. Um, I think uh, moving towards more transdisciplinary research uh, will be very, very important moving forward, that uh, combining Inuit Kayamaya Kangagit and the Western science. Um, I think that that's going to provide the clearest picture moving forward. IQ gives us sort of that long-term historical snapshot of the, the area, the ecosystem, the species that, that we're studying. Um, but there were questions we were trying to address and, and sort of the Western science complements that with more the, the quantitative <laughs> side of things. So it, it's that, that two eyed seeing approach where you look at your questions through an indigenous lens and also the Western science lens. So I, I think that that's going to be very important moving forward. And I think uh, that it'll be important to sort of incorporate that type of research right from the onset. So helping to sort of drive the questions that, uh, that we're looking at. And, and we've used in uh, kind of taking that approach in a few studies and, and we are very fortunate to start looking at or addressing questions that we would have never even thought of without sort of talking to uh, and listening to local resource users and, and community members. So I, I think that's gonna be very important. And then I think uh, uh, community-based monitoring initiatives, I think are gonna become very important. It's it's relying on the folks that are in the communities, the ones that are using their resources, the ones that are, are going to be out on the land. It's, it's super expensive for us from the South to come there anyways, and, and it's logistically challenging. And I think that uh, involving more people, especially those in the community, is gonna be extremely valuable for just noting everything from, from char health or differences in environmental conditions, new species, that are, are coming into the community. And, and I think that in the face of climate change, that's gonna be really, really important to have that, that baseline information and, and the people on the ground so that we can see potential changes moving forward. So I think uh, more transdisciplinary research, including IQ and, and community-based monitoring initiatives are gonna be very important going forward. Thank you.
Thank you. And Marlene just uh, put a link into chat. I think, is this the pamphlet that you were talking about before? About parasites in fish? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very good pamphlet. Okay, okay thank you. Um, Norman, you have your hand up. And then I will, uh, after we will um, ask uh, Ninguile uh, to, to comment, uh, the, the ladies there, and then we'll wrap up. So um, where did you go? Norman, yes. Um, I don't want to skip Ningula. I think his hand was yeah. up first. You, you will, I, I will. We've also asked them to give closing remarks. So we'll just, we'll, okay, we'll finish um, with them. Um, in terms of uh, research development, uh, we definitely need a large scale of um, research in Nunavut. And we don't have researching uh, place like, uh, like uh, Winnipeg has. I think uh, there should be more of a centralized research facility to uh, to conduct more places like uh, Western uh, Inuit and East Inuit in uh, Kivalak region. And um, in my home, uh, this fish plant is basically our our our. Um, little input of our own fisheries in terms of um, commercial. But if we uh, con conduct more of uh, commercial fishing in throughout Nunavut, I think uh, we'll have more answers in each corner of how the, the fishing and fishes are. There's difference in uh, fishery management, and uh, there's a total different in fisherman management. And those two will never really combine. But if we have more of a research done, maybe um, we can commercialize more places, more lakes, and and have more fishermen in each community and to have better liability in fishery and um, maybe uh, on the other hand, we, we need more of a meeting like this. Um, since I took part of this meeting, we only hear uh, for me anyways, uh, in my community, like uh, uh, Steven from NWMB, um, it's, it's, it's only part of our communication organization that we're able to uh, confront to, because uh, there's not many places that we can turn into if we wanna study, if we wanna research as an individual, but, in, in terms of that, and, and if, like, uh, for example, for one lake, um, I need to go through my HTO approval. I need, you know, we need more of a hand that don't need much of a, I'm pretty sure less knows this and some researchers from DFO, because most likely we find brick walls if we want to do other lakes and we're allow only five lakes in one particular year. Why not all of them, you know? And, and that's, because that, for me traveling hundred miles to uh, Naulinabik that less probably took part before, for example. And it was it was three days and minus thirty. <laughs> we were able to conduct 
200 fish. And it's, it's Inuit knowledge, it's um, scientific research knowledge. I think it's becoming more of a good point to have more understanding in fishing throughout Nunavut. That's what I'm trying to say and do some more research in, in our water bodies. Yeah, if I'm correct, thank you. I'm... Thank you, Norman. Um, Ninguiole, would you be able to uh, respond and then finish with a uh, with with your closing remarks? But you have a question or a comment first. Oh, you're muted. Um, no, um, it's not a question. It's just a comment. Uh, or if I'm uh, I have to be going to work, work soon. Like, and just curious to how much longer uh, the meeting is going to be. Oh. Thank you very much. If this is actually the end because we're almost at uh, two o'clock Eastern time, noon in in your time. So actually, could we? Um, oh. Um, could we ask um, um, how much time, how much more time do you have? Like two minutes, five minutes? Uh, yeah, ten minutes is good. Ten, ten minutes. Okay, great. I see that Eva and Timothy have their hand up, and then I'd like to come back to you for the closing remarks, if if we could do that. Great. Uh, Eva, Timothy, you have your hand up. Thank you. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, my question is, um, I'll try to be brief because of um, it's for researchers. I think it's maybe it could be two questions and I, I'm happy to see that you have the male and female researchers here. Perhaps they could respond to that. And as you know, fish stocks, they're all different. And you know, the trout tend to be in um, more sandier lakes. So my question is that maybe the sand, for me, my preference of trout is like if they're in a lake that has more sand. So my question is, have you found out if that affects the the meat of the fish in what type of lake they're in. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Marlene. Uh, I, I can answer the specific specifics of, of uh, the lake trout, the re researchers don't have much information on lake trout in the, the lakes up in Nunavut. Um, but there have the, the people who have done some small studies, myself and then uh, Mary Gamberger and Virginia Walker, we have been measuring mercury in the fish and the mercury in the lake trout is on the higher side, like in that slide that I had. So, um, those mercury data are being evaluated by Health Canada just to decide what kind of advice they might be wanting to, to give to communities about eating those fish. But um, if you have any, any lake trout in your lakes that you'd like to have looked at for, for mercury or want to share some information, we, there might be a possibility to look at that aspect of them more. Uh, when researchers do look at the fish, they look at length and weight and how fat they are in their age. So they get very coarse measures of fish health. We also look at the liver and things of that type. So that's the best answer I can give you. Thanks, Marlene. Hey, I'd, I'd like to thank everybody today and um, to I'd like to invite Nimiole 
and your um, participants joining with you to give closing remarks, please. Sorry about that. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity this afternoon, this midday. And we will try to be patient in our own lives in the future. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful because you are our keeper and you've been able to provide us this opportunity today to allow to hear different ideas and perspectives. And you've allowed us to listen and hear from the minds of those that have knowledge with regard to the food that we eat on an everyday basis. And I know that planning is in place for us in our lives, in our communities, in our country. And with regard to being able to maintain a balance of allowing food to be continued to be available to our, to our people. And so when it, whenever it's possible, particularly those that are fleeing as refugees to be able to allow them to continue to have food, Lord. I plead to you to keep everybody safe and allow them to have food, whether they are food from our oceans, whether they are food from the land. And we seek that you will continue to allow us to have food for all of us and that we may have peace. Thank you for having this time together today and those that facilitated this event. We pray to you, Lord, that there may be more planning to allow opportunities and engagement to take place. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. And that brings our webinar today to a close. I'd like to thank all the panelists who participated today and shared your knowledge and for all of your wonderful questions as well. I want to give a special thank you to our translators today, uh, Lisa, Iris, and Dorothy, for all of your hard work and uh, making sure that we could all understand each other. We have another webinar tomorrow at this time. It's on climate change. If you haven't registered for it, you can go back to Eventbrite and register for that uh, one as well, or for our webinars next week, which are on uh, marine mammals and another one on Canada and the Antarctic. So hope to see you again. And uh, thank you. That brings our webinar to a close for today.